challenge my assumptions. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I am very, very pleased to be here. I want to thank John. I want to thank all of you from Jobs of Justice. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. As John mentioned, we had a wonderful fundraiser for PDA last night. And uh, those of you that were there, some of what I'm going to say I said last night, but I'm going to take I'll be going into more depth on a few points. So I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I actually want to preface my remarks uh, because I was struck by something that was said last night by someone about the anniversary yesterday of the Triangle Shirtless Fire. Um, and I was thinking that the, the tragedy that was that fire resulted in a movement, um, actually a couple of different movements. There were a sort of movement for reform, there was a workers for organizing, and I was thinking about what's happened in the last century, and that we now are far more numb to tragedies, unless they are for individuals. In other words, when you think about what we hear, there was an immense amount focused on the unfortunate death of Michael Jackson, uh, an immense amount. Um, and I was a great fan of his music. Um, there was an immense amount focused on, several years ago, in Washington, D.C., the uh, disappearance of a woman named Chandra Levy. Um, so we end up focusing on individuals, but we actually don't know what to make of mass tragedy. They don't necessarily have the same impact in terms of inspiring movements. And we need to think about that. There was the uh, fire in North Carolina in the early 90s, a uh, poultry plant, and where I think it was 20 something, 25. 25 women were killed. And I thought at the time, this is definitely going to inspire workers to organize, and it didn't quite work out that way. Um, and it's something that I think is, is worth really looking at about how we've become numb and how people have difficulty thinking about massive tragedies and what to do about them. And it actually also relates to how we have to tackle the right. Um, because what the right does, something I mentioned last night, is that the right focuses on individual stories. And they take those individuals and they weave a story a story that is wrong, but is a story that often people can relate to. It's like everyone has a public sector worker story. You know, there's, there's at least one incident that you've had with a public sector worker somewhere that's just simply pissed you off. You know, and it's just sort of like uh, something I've said to people in the New York City Taxi Workers Alliance. Everybody has a taxi story. There's at least one time you had a drive in a taxi that just really pissed you off. And instead of understanding that, that was one story, one episode, people extrapolate. The right is extremely good at that. We're not. Um, so let me now turn to what I wanted to focus on. And I, I'm not going to start with Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm not even going to start with November 2010. I want to paint a much bigger picture uh, to set the context. Because I think that if we don't get the bigger picture, we don't understand uh, where we have to go at the level of strategy. So I want to suggest to you that part of what makes this moment so unusual is that we're living in the moment of the convergence of three mega crises. Um, it's not just an economic crisis that we're facing. We're facing an economic crisis, an environmental crisis, of historic proportions, and a crisis of the legitimacy of government. And this is, this is not just a crisis in the United States, it's a crisis that we start seeing all around the world. These three crises are, pulling, are, are, are coming together, and they're having this impact. The, uh, the economic crisis was not simply about the, the financial collapse in 2008, but it was the, uh, the crisis that is engendered by capitalism with overproduction of capital and of goods, com combined with a financial crisis, 
uh, which led many of us to think that neoliberalism was going to be itself collapsing. We have an environmental crisis. And it's amazing that there's still people that deny that we have an environmental crisis, that there's a climate crisis. You know, we had these idiot Republicans last year that said after we received a number of snowstorms in the Northeast that this proved that there was no global warming. <laughs> I'm saying, my God. I mean, you know, it's like, there's no, looking at snowstorms in the Northeast and that's saying that there's no global warming? I mean, what about the fact that the polar cap is melting? I mean, and what about this past summer, the hottest summer on record? I mean, what, what is it? But again, there's both a level of popular denial, but there's also a level of denial that is moved by corporate and political objectives. But we have that crisis, that crisis that could threaten our humanity, as many people are talking about. But then we have this crisis that, that is not discussed very much, which is the crisis of the legitimacy of the state or the legitimacy of government. And it's very much related to the economic crisis because what's happened, particularly with the advent of neoliberalism, is that as funds and resources have been allocated away from government and allocated more and more to a smaller and smaller section of the population, the resources for government are disappearing. And, and this is one of those circumstances where it's really important for us to understand that the facts never speak for themselves. People speak. People interpret facts. So the disappearance of resources, such that people say, well, I used to have my garbage picked up three times a week, and now it's once. I used to uh, be able to go to a park, and it was free, and now I have to pay. Well, there's different conclusions that you can draw from those same set of facts. And what the right has done has been to basically say more and more that government is useless, government gets in the way, and essentially the people have to rely more and more on themselves. And it's in that environment that relying more and more on themselves leads to or can lead to something very ominous, which is the creation of alternative communities. And by alternative communities, I don't mean communes, folks. I mean when people start, like the rich have, guarded and gated communities with armed response uh, boards posted around. I'm talking about when you have right-wing militias that have developed armament that is not anywhere near like what they had, the, the gangs had in, uh, in the 1950s, 60s, or 70s, but when you have armed militias that have artillery, mortars, bazookas, rocket-propelled grenades, machine guns, etc where they're basically saying that we have to prepare for some sort of Armageddon-like scenario. And that we, depending on how one determines we, we have to protect ourselves. But this is not just in the United States. You can see extreme versions of this, for example, in Rwanda, the Rwanda genocide, where you had this uh, distinction between the Hutus and the Tutsis that was not based on any kind of genetics, but was, a, uh, but was something that was essentially created by the Belgians to divide the population in order to continue Belgian colonial rule. But that had a, had a legacy. And you had a situation where the population, the Hutu population, was convinced that the nature of the problem that they faced as resources were shrinking was not found in something called neoliberalism, not found in something called imperialism, but was found in what they identified to be the, the, the Tutsi domination of society. Therefore, eliminate the Tutsis. This sort of genocidal notion is becoming more and more common around the world. And it, it takes extreme forms, as I just mentioned, and less extreme forms in Italy. The rise of right-wing movements like the Northern Leagues that basically have said that too, much, uh, too many of the resources of Italy have gone to the poor, and specifically the southern region of Italy, Sicily and, and southern Italy, and that, that, the, that the richer uh, regions of Italy need to capture and hold more of the resources which they believe that they're entitled to. 
And it's in that situation that the role of the government, the role of the state itself is being challenged as we have this very peculiar fragmentation. And I say peculiar because it's happening at the same time that we're witnessing the emergence of a transnational capitalist class. I mean, that's one of the things that's very odd. You have these small countries that are starting to spring out out of this, uh, various secession movements. But you start to see, at a global level, these connections between what used to be nationally based capitalism, where these capitalists are identifying more and more with themselves and with other capitalists in other countries, and less and less with the people of the countries that they happen to be based in. And when that happens, it becomes much easier to basically start to suggest that more and more wealth and resources need to be captured by the few and to hell with the rest. And at the global level, it's really amazing. The United Nations uh, determined about 10 years, 10 years ago that 225 people had more wealth than the bottom 47% of the world's population. And we're talking about more wealth than roughly 2.5 billion people. In the United States, you have about 400 people that have more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population. And when you have the stark polarization, those at the top start to look at those at the bottom as a different race. And not, I'm not just talking about race in the, in the level of color. They start to look at those at the bottom as a different kind of population that is completely and totally disposable. The nice word is redundancy. So we have, in the midst of this convergence of these three crises, different solutions that are being offered, those that are coming from the left and those that are coming from the right. And I just want to say a little bit about what's happening out of the right. Because we have, in the, in the right in the United States, we have the reemergence of right-wing populism and we have the corporate right. And as I said last night, right-wing populism is the herpes of capitalism. <clears throat> it is the disease that is in the system that once it's in, does not leave the system, but disappears. But it reemerges in times of crisis. It reemerges when its system weakens. And what we see periodically throughout the history of the United States is the reemergence of right-wing populism as a way of addressing a systemic crisis. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a movement and a way of thinking that's completely irrational, but nevertheless is very, very potent, particularly for whites, because it often answers this question of why are we, that is, why are whites not being treated well at a particular moment? You see, one of the things in the United States with right-wing populism it, that it's critical for us to understand, which we almost never talk about in labor, is that there's an assumption in, in the myth of U.S. history. And it's a basic assumption that it's understandable, and to some, some people it's okay, <coughs> that misery falls to people of color, but it's not supposed to happen to white people. And when it happens to white people, this is one of these things that shakes people up. Why is this happening? When we have been told as whites that our, the lives of our children will be always better than our lives, how can we find ourselves in a situation when that is no longer in operation? Who is to blame? And when you have a labor movement that fears talking about capitalism, and fears talking about class, and fear is talking about how these dynamics work, right when populism enters in. And when right when populism enters in, it sometimes sounds like it's coming from the left. <coughs> Pat Buchanan. Right? When you listen to Pat Buchanan speak on many times, uh, many occasions, he, he almost sounds like he's a leftist until there's like sort of the end point, right, about what he actually sees as the nature of the problem and what he sees as a solution. We are so unprepared to address right-wing populism because we fear talking about 
what is the actual nature of the problem they're up against. And so the right-wing populists move in. And when they move in, if there's a financial crisis, they start going Jew hunting. And they always do that when there's a financial, not just an economic crisis. When there's a financial crisis, the right-wing populists go hunting for Jews. And they did this in the fall of 2008. They were a little bit more subtle. But they basically were looking for, there were some of these mccain Palin rallies where the right-wingers were talking about naming names in the midst of the financial crisis. And at that moment, I was trying to figure out, why, why do they want to name names? They want to start arresting people? I said, that would be an interesting development. But no, that's not what they were talking about. They wanted a list of Jews that they identified as being the source of the financial crunch. Did our movement say anything about it? Not a word. Not a word. Right? No discussion of anti-Semitism. Right? In the midst of uh, an economic crisis, the right wing also looks for other groups. Immigrants. What about our movement? Well, our movement has been a little bit better in the last 10, 15 years on, on immigration. Uh, except for one thing. We've talked about the immorality of the treatment of immigrants. But what we don't really talk about is why do people come to the United States? Um, see, if you, if you parallel the post-1965 immigration with the immigration from the 19th century up to 1914, you draw all the wrong conclusions. Salvadorans did not come here for the same reasons the Sicilians did. Right? I knew one Salvadoran before 1980, and she was very wealthy and I went to college with her. And now I know entire villages of Salvadorans. So what happened after 1980? Let's think about this for a second. Right? 1980. Oh, that's right, there was a war. Right? And didn't the United States have something to do with that war? Right? Um, see, that is something that our movement doesn't seem to want to talk about. We don't want to, we don't want to talk about why are people coming here? Why do we have all these Filipinos? Could it have something to do with the fact that the US occupied the Philippines much of the 20th century? Or what about, where did all these Dominicans come from in New York in the late 1960s? Where the hell did they come from, right? And why, why beginning in 1966? Oh, could it have something to do with the fact that the US invaded the Dominican Republic in 1965? We don't want to talk about this. And if you don't talk about why people come here, we will not win the battle on immigration. We will lose. We will be good moralists. We will be good humanists, but we will lose the battle. Because the only way people are going to understand why this issue of immigration is so important is if you talk about why people have come here in the first place. Right-wing populists have easier answers. While we're silent, they provide answers. And we find ourselves in such a weakened position because we, we often fear talking about this. Um, now, I'm realizing that I could quickly run out of time. So let me jump a little bit uh, to this. Um, in 2008, we elected Barack Obama and uh, a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate. And we made a series of mistakes at that moment. One mistake was thinking that the Democratic Party was a party. Um, and that was a fundamental strategic mistake we keep making. The Democratic Party is not a party, it's a party bloc. It is a, it's the equivalent of what they have in Europe and other places. We have a coalition. And so the fact that there was a Democratic majority was frankly meaningless because the question was what kind of Democrats were, were there and what politics. And we saw this play out in healthcare. We saw both Obama's premature compromises, but we saw various uh, Democrats being very quickly prepared to jettison, uh, certainly single payer, but the public option. Right? We saw that around EFCA, right, where Many of us believed, and unfortunately, too many leaders of organized labor thought it was going to be a completely inside the beltway fight as opposed to taking it into our communities. But we had AFCA, and then all of a sudden, with this Democratic majority, they head for the hills. It basically ends up being abandoned. So we've got to understand strategically that there is no one Democratic party. There are several Democratic parties. 
And part of our job, and I think I can say this, even though Jobs and Justice isn't a partisan organization, but I can say this, that part of our job really has to be to focus on the people who have the politics that we share, not whether they're wearing a badge of a donkey or an elephant. Whose politics? What are they actually representing? And do they come out of our movement? Do they sound like us? And are they actually us? So we had, that was one problem. The second problem <coughs> was how we assessed Obama. So the election of Obama was clearly historic. Uh, in, in the context of the United States. I voted for him, I supported him. But one of the things that we, mistaken, we, we, we were mistaken about as, as movements was this notion that once elected that we could go back to the barracks, right? that we could basically go home and leave it to him. And as I said last night, in the lead up to the election, I was asked on many occasions, should we provide him with a honeymoon period, and I said yes, and they said, how long? And I said, 24 hours. <laughs> and I believe that history has demonstrated that I was correct. That, that the labor movement, the African American movement, every movement gave him a honeymoon period of at a minimum months, and some would argue at least a year, where there was silence in the face of decisions that were being made that none of us were comfortable with. And at a point when we should have been in the streets demanding jobs, demanding a bigger stimulus, demanding policies, instead of that, we were in the barracks. And we were waiting to be called out. I mean, people, I would see these columns where people would say, we need Obama to mobilize us. No, danger, Will Robinson. What do you mean we need him to call us out? We should have called ourselves out. We should have been out there. And as a result, we had November 2010. Now, it's important for us to understand that even though the numbers of Republicans that won were very significant, if you look at the elections, what really struck me was how close they were. And, um, and, and so this was, this was quite striking because what it said to me was that in a situation where you had a demobilized Democratic electorate, the Republicans still squeaked out these victories in most cases. Some places they obviously did much better, but they squeaked them out, which means that this situation remains very volatile and could flip quite easily in 2012, and it could flip the right way if we, if we do the right thing. But November came and there was despair, and it was, oh, woe well, is me, it's all over. Uh, and, it, and the Republicans decided that this election was the moment for the final offensive. The final offensive aimed at two things. One is wiping out all that remains of the New Deal and wiping out the Union War. And strategically, their approach was quite interesting and I think made a lot of sense, except they didn't count on one thing happening. They decided that at the beginning of their administrations, they would move a blitzkrieg. And they would quickly move various kinds of legislation to crush unions, to, to, to uh, do various kinds of tax proposals, etc. And that basically in two years, people would have gotten used to their misery, or they would have forgotten. Now, I know you're going to say they didn't count on Wisconsin. That's not what I was going to say. They didn't count on the Arab Democratic Revolt. <laughs> no one that I know predicted the Arab Revolt. No one. Well, let me put it like this. There's some people that said, at some point, there'll be a revolt. I don't count on that. That's sort of like Cain saying, in the final analysis, we're all dead. Yeah. Um, so, no, there was no one that expected it right then. Uh, four months ago, you had been lying if you would have said Mubarak is weeks away from being tossed. Um, Ali in, uh, in Yemen, close supporter of the United States. The Bahraini regime. Gaddafi. Right? I mean, who would have thought this? But the Arab people decided differently. 
And what was remarkable was it was an, it was an internal, it was an indigenous revolt. It wasn't that there were foreign forces, and they were succeeding. And this had a global impact. It may, in fact, turn out to have reshaped global politics. We will have to see on that. But one thing that became clear is that it had an impact on the people of Wisconsin. Because the demonstrations that started in Wisconsin would, in my opinion, never have happened had it not been for the Arab Revolt. What would have happened, as I said last night, is that there would have been a very big demonstration. Very big. And then at the end of the demonstration, everyone would have gone home. They would have cried and shaked their hands and said, we gave it all we could have, and now we just have to hunker, around, hunker down. The fact that people stayed in the capital and stayed and it grew, and tractors start coming in. I mean, this was really phenomenal. I mean, we haven't seen anything like this in decades. The Republicans didn't count on it. And, and, and I think that our hats are off to the people of Wisconsin, and our hats should be off to the people in the Arab world. That there was this issue of courage that we have to, that, that is so, so critically important. The people in the Arab world and people in Wisconsin were willing to take certain steps, knowing full well that they could have been killed, arrested. I mean, you had that idiot in Indiana that suggested live ammunition. I'll tell you one thing, folks. If it had been black folks in Wisconsin, they would have used live ammunition. Like, we are very lucky it was white folks that initiated this thing in Wisconsin. And my hats are off to them. Right? Because had it been people of color, I know that they would have figured out some way to have used live ammunition, if not just wholesale arrests. But the point is that people nevertheless had great courage, and, and uh, it, was, it was deeply, deeply inspiring. But there's limitations. This is not a criticism. It's something for us to think about for strategy. It was defensive. We weren't going on the offensive. Um, it was relying primarily on our traditional base, although what was exciting about Wisconsin is that it started to draw people from other movements. But here's one of, the, there, were, there were two other problems I want to highlight. One is that the union movement conceded on economics too quickly. Right? Um, and the second is that we did not have an alternative vision that we were articulating about the public sector. And I would suggest to you that that's going to be one of our critical tasks going forward. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, having an alternative vision. See, what was interesting in watching the polls is that the vast majority of the population in the United States defended collective bargaining rights. They don't want to see people's rights taken away. But they started wobbling on that economics. And I think that that shows our weakness, that we have not won people over to understand what is the nature of the economic problem. Right? That it's not about the public sector workers are a little bit too uh, overpaid or whatever. But that, that's, that, that, that the problem really lies in what I was describing earlier with this massive polarization. Of so we have to have an alternative vision, and I'll get to that. Um, we also have to understand that in a moment like this, we are going to win some and we're going to lose some. Uh, that, uh, I used this uh, metaphor last night and, and in some other talks about the situation in the very beginning of World War II. And I think that it's important for us because I, it points to or highlights some of the problems that we have. If you think about March 1942, three months out of Pearl Harbor. You think about the situation that the world was facing right then, and there was no basis for optimism, at least on our side. You know, North Africa was falling to the Germans. Islands were falling to the Japanese. Um, the, uh, it was not clear what was going to happen in the Soviet Union. The, the Germans had just been stopped in Moscow, mainly because of the weather. And in that situation, there was absolutely no basis for optimism. Nevertheless, what was developed was a theory and strategy of a counteroffensive, including the importance of making mischief on the other side. I don't know how many of you are students of World War II, but you may remember Doolittle's raid on Tokyo. 
1942. There was a book and movie called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. And the, the, the US in, uh, carried out this incredible attack where they launched these B-25s off the USS Hornet. Never been done in history to blast several cities in Japan. The military damage to this was negligible. The psychological impact was profound, both in Japan and the United States. Because the Jap Japanese thought themselves to be invulnerable up until that point. And the U.S. having just as su suffered the worst disaster it had ever faced in Pearl Harbor was completely shaken and all of a sudden they realized we could actually hit back. Doolittle's raid provoked the Japanese to move on Midway. And when the U.S. defeated the Japanese at Midway, it, it changed the course of the of war in the Pacific. Right? It was creating mischief. Roosevelt and others knew what they were doing. It's called creating mischief. Every so often, you have to go into the enemy's camp, even when you know that something you're going to do may not ultimately succeed, but it raises sufficient doubt in the enemy's camp. The right wing is moving these right wing, uh, these right to I was right wing, right to work laws, so called, in different states. <coughs> and the question I keep asking my friends throughout the labor movement is, why aren't we moving initiatives in Alabama, Mississippi, to ensure the rights of workers, including the rights to join and form unions and have union shop agreements? Why aren't we moving these initiatives? People say, well, it's completely unrealistic. It's no more unrealistic than when the right wing goes to California and starts moving some of the most ridiculous initiatives God has ever known, right? But they move them knowing full well that we will panic, we will put resources into California that need to go into Mississippi, right? We will go chasing after them. They know what they're doing, even though they know that they're going to lose. When will we create mischief? So in other words, we have to be thinking about an entire theory and strategy of the counteroffensive. We've got to be thinking about not just simply how do we defend public sector collective bargaining, but how do we take out some of our opponents nonviolently? I have to say that I don't know who's in the room, and I do not want to see my face on Glenn Beck. So not violent. How do we take them out? How do we move against them? How do we actually flip the script? How do we go from this, this pitiful reliance that we had in 2009 on the Democrats in Congress around EFCA, how do we go from that to saying that if we're going to move labor law reform, We've got to move it in Kansas City, right? We've got to move it in Boise, right? We've got to move it in Vicksburg, right? We've got to move it where people are so that people understand that there's a direct connection between collective bargaining and economic justice, yeah. right? How do we do that? So I'm running out of time. So let me uh, then jump straight back to this question of what do we do and what sort of movement do we need? Let me start by saying that um, the, the leadership of organized labor, I think it's fair to say, dreams of the reemergence of the New Deal, of Roosevelt's New Deal. Folks, it ain't coming back. <laughs> Let's be very clear. As this great Egyptian theorist Samir Amin has said, the welfare state was based on cheap oil. It was based on cheap oil, and I would add to that, the ruling elite's decisions that they had to make concessions to the working classes in the advanced capitalist world, and they had the Soviet Union looking over their shoulder. Right? But the financial ability to have the welfare state was based on cheap oil and, uh, and basically the colonies. Well, colonies don't exist anymore, and cheap oil ain't there. So, when we're talking now, we have to think about what is our vision. This is one of the reasons that ideas that once seemed very radical are right now quite reasonable. Single payer for many people at one point was seen as a radical idea, it's quite reasonable. There's other ideas that relate to the environment that now are quite reasonable, but it's going to mean a dramatic power shift. 
which means that our movement has to think, and when I'm talking about our movement, I'm talking about the progressive movement, not just organized labor. Our movement has to think at the level of fighting for power. Fighting for power, not fighting to put another good Democrat in. A good Democrat is only good if they're backing the positions of the popular movements. Otherwise, I don't care whether they have a donkey or an elephant, right? The point is that we've got to have power. We've got to see our objective as, as, as fighting for power. We have to have alternative proposals about reforming and uh, saving the public sector, about the environment, about economic development. Um, we have to be rethinking the issue of international affairs. And I was talking to someone before we got started who is doing anti-war work uh, about the labor movement. And this is one of those issues that the labor movement, by and large, doesn't really want to talk that much about. And my hat goes off to US Labor Against the War for having forced the question, particularly on the matter of um, uh, Iraq. But there's something else that we need to do. And, and if we're going to really be serious about fighting for power, and this is particularly directed at organized labor, we have to think about different sorts of alliances. Organized labor is very tactical when it comes to alliances. That is, if we need you today, we'll go searching for you. If we're in trouble, we'll go find a minister. Right? Um, you know, we'll maybe go ask some students to turn out in support of, of our cause. And then when we've won, or at least stabilized the situation, it's hasta la vista. Right? And then, worse, when you come and say, can you support us? Say, well, I'm sorry, you've got to understand the unions work. Right? That's the way this, the rap usually goes. Right? And so we have these tactical alliances. Rarely do we think about strategic alliances. Rarely do we think about who are the other social forces that we need, not just today, and not just tomorrow, and not just in a month, but over the next 10 to 20 years, if we're talking about a real power shift in this country, who are those social movements, and how do we develop a comprehensive alliance with them? And I would say that if we cannot figure that out, we are history. We are history, because the right will play us like strings on a violin. So our objective, really at this point, needs to be identifying those strategic allies and figuring out how do we engage in a comprehensive struggle for power. Um, we also have to combine electoral and mass work. And this is one of the great lessons of the uh, Wisconsin fight. I got into this argument with this um, ultra-leftist the other day. Um, I'm not going to name his name, but he's an ultra-leftist. Just trust me. So he was basically saying to me, you know, um, Wisconsin shows the importance of mass action. I said, it does. I said, it also shows something else. He says, what's that? He said, well, the importance of electoral politics. He says, but it really shows the importance of mass action. I said, that's right. And it really shows the importance of electoral politics. Well, we obviously didn't agree. Um, but what did it do? OK. The Democratic senators that split town, I would put a dollar to a donut that would have gone nowhere. Had masses of people not been in the streets of Madison, they wouldn't have gone anywhere. They would have given their speeches. They would have condemned the governor. And they would have voted against him, and that would have been it. <coughs> but I say one other thing. I don't think people would have stayed as long as they did had those Democratic senators not had the courage to split town right. and go to Illinois. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? it, was this, right? it was this dialectical relationship between the two. The fact that you had the Democratic senators that were sitting out that reinforced for people that were there that, yeah, I guess we are right. And those Democratic senators wouldn't dare return when you had thousands of people in the streets that were saying, you need to stay in Illinois, right? The importance of having an electoral component to our effort cannot be overstated. So in that sense, it's not just about electing people. It's about electing people. It's about holding them accountable. But it's about understanding that we need mass pressure in order to ensure that elected people do the right thing. But those elected people, particularly if they're good, can be incredibly inspiring. They can be the people that help to bring together some of the disparate social forces 
that may not otherwise be talking with one another, they can help to bring them, to bring them together and speak on their behalf and express support. And we can't overstate that, which is why we need a different kind of politics. And our hope, my hope, is that we raise enough hell within organized labor that we get the movement to understand that we either have a different kind of politics or, in fact, we will be condemned to that proverbial dustbin of history. Thank you very much. seen an opportunity in front of us like we have today, but it's up to us to take advantage of it and not let it uh, go by. At the same time, I've never seen the labor movement in greater danger, and I think that's really the dialectic, if you will, Bill, uh, in, in front of us today, that there is a war, in this, and I know people in Western Mass don't like military analogies, but there is a war going on in this country, and it's, and it's really a war for the survival of any level of basic human decency uh, in society and any level of basic ability to provide for your family. And as, as Bill said, they have a very clear vision and they have a very clear ideology and they know exactly what they want. Because they want a handful of people with all the wealth and the rest of us work for them. Um, their vision is no job security, no benefits, everybody's attempt Right? And, and, we, and we make poverty level wages. That's their vision for us. And I think especially for young people, you have to think if that's what you want the world to be like that you're going to be living in for the next you know, 50, 60 years. Because that's, that's what they're implementing right now. Yeah. I think what's changed, as, as Bill said, is, is the revolt in the Middle East. Because it's clear to everybody in this country that we have to make a choice. Right? I think everybody in this country has, has one, ch one fundamental choice to make, which is do you fight or do you not? We can argue about how we should fight, what our strategy is, what our tactics are, but I think right now the fundamental decision is do you fight or not? Are you going to commit yourself to trying to fight what's going on in this country? Are you going to try to commit yourself to fighting to change the society and this world? Or are you just going to let it happen? And I think more and more people see what it means to just let it happen, right? It's not pretty. And I think people every day see in the Middle East, people are making that fundamental decision. People in Syria making the decision. They're just not going to... You know, somebody said from Libya the other day, said, we're sitting on a sea of oil, but we don't have schools, we don't have hospitals. What's with that? Right? One family has all the money in Libya. You know, so they have made a decision that that's just not how they want to live. You know, they're going to fight, and even if they, you know, in their case, lose their lives, they're willing to do that. And I think we're in the same situation, not as quite as dramatic uh, in this country, but we have to make that decision. You know, the, there's the greatest transfer of wealth in human history that's taken place in the last 30 years, right? And, and Bill described the results of that. They have taken untold wealth from workers in the private sector. I worked at General Electric for 20 years, I can tell you about that. Over the, over the last 30 years, right? They had so much wealth, they gambled it in the casino economy, they crashed the economy, right? Now we're supposed to pay for the crisis, and on top of that, they turn around and say to the public sector workers, well, you have it really good, because the people in the private sector, you know, lost that 20 years ago. Well, who, how did they lose it? How did you lose it? We lost it to the same people that are out to crush the public sector units, and I think you know, I think basically they are overreaching. Um, they are greedy, right? They are greedy for money. They are greedy for power. They are greedy for, for everything. 
and uh, and I believe that they are beginning to overreach themselves. But that is only going to become a pro they could overreach themselves and succeed, right? And that's what they're going for. There's a law in New Hampshire that's moving along to make public sector workers employees at will. I don't know if the students here, the young people here, know what that means. It means you can be fired for any reason at any time. That's the future for everybody. Because once they're, well, guess what? Most workers in America are employees at will, and it's not pretty, right? And unions are the only protection we have. And I think what we're seeing in, in the United States now is people finally beginning to understand the role that unions play in the economy, and finally beginning to understand the role that unions play in a democracy. And that that's, both of those are at stake. Any ability to provide for your family at a decent level is at stake. Any ability to restrain the unbridled efforts of the rich to control everything in the political arena is at stake. And they, the rich know it. That's why they're trying to crush unions, right? So I think there's a unique moment here. We've seen people in the African-American community in Boston rising up, speaking out against the attacks on unions. We've seen students rising up. We've seen the immigrant community rising up. We are going to have a whole series. We have seen mobilization around Wisconsin, in Boston, out here in Western Mass, across the country. We need to keep that momentum going. We have a series of actions in Boston, April 4th, which is a National Day of Action. I hope there is uh, many actions being planned out here as well. We have April 14th, we're going to march. There's going to be a major rally in Boston. May 1st, there's going to be a major march and rally. Last year, there were 5,000 mostly immigrants. This year, the immigrants have said, hey, wait a minute. It's not just us anymore. It's everybody, right? And that's a hopeful sign. So uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, we also, I think, are lucky, well not lucky, we are fortunate to have an organization like Jobs of Justice that, and I say this as a lifelong union member, that is more nimble than the labor movement itself. And I think Jobs of Justice has an important role to spearhead, right, not only the defensive battles but the counteroffensive that Bill was talking about. But it doesn't happen without you. And like I said, we all have that decision to make. And Jobs of Justice is a place where you can help decide how that counteroffensive takes place. You can help decide that this, you know, the, the fate of this country and the fate of the world. I, I truly believe that. It's not the only organization, but it's an organization, and it's your organization. So thanks for having us uh, here today, and also you know, look forward. We need your time. We need your money. We, we also need your ideas, right? Because nobody has really figured this out. I think if they had, you know, it would be kind of obvious. So that's exciting too, because I've been in situations where everything's figured out for you. I'd much rather be in the situation we have in the world today, as challenging as it is, but the possibilities are limitless. Thank you. Hey, as quick as I can, what's the labor movement doing? We just came back from Detroit, where the UAW is starting to get the idea that we have to organize the transplants. If no one knows what those are, those are all the foreign companies that come into this country and operate like they never would back in their home countries. You have companies from France, Germany, other places where the unionized workers would destroy them if they tried to pull the bullshit they're pulling on us. The UAW's been under attack. We were under attack first because we are one of the unions that has long stood for civil rights and has done some incredible organizing in areas that nobody else started to do until more recently, frankly. You know, we lost opportunities along the way here. We elected Deval Patrick. Nobody thought he was a progressive either, but we thought maybe he was better than what we were facing on the other side of the fence. We did not hold him accountable. We did the same thing with Obama. We have not held him accountable. EFCA, we've had stuck up our ass. It was a great piece of legislation that went nowhere because people thought we elected somebody and the job was done, as Bill said. It's not. It's never done. We need to keep fighting. You know, we run into this crap here all the time. I worked at the Sisters of Providence Hospital, as I like to say, a Catholic, although not very Christian organization. <laughs> I had a question for Bill. <laughs> How can we stop supporting people who are what uh, my friend Kevin Noonan used to refer to as poverty pimps? The people who front organizations that basically profit on the backs of workers. We've had two murders in the human service field since the beginning of the year, both tragic, both 
avoidable, and now we have the governor who's created a task force. You know, I don't care if somebody's good for gay marriage. I'm gay. Good. But when they're bad for labor and they oppose unions, it's bullshit that we give them a pass. So, how can we stop doing that? <laughs> Let's get all the questions. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> we have to uh, Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, thanks for coming. It's great to hear you speak. Maybe um, stand up a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you were talking about that we need to find a different kind of politics. And I'm assuming that from what you said about the Republican bloc, you're talking about like, the Democratic bloc. So, out of that, and, you know, like the labor movement, there's this emphasis on the middle class. I mean, I think that's a weakening point. I don't think the Arab revolts came out of the middle class. I may not be correct on that, but the kind of energy that comes out of the main revolts doesn't necessarily come out of the middle class, but we have a middle class, we have middle class consciousness. So uh, my question is, how, how do you use that as part of the democratic bloc to, to do what you're talking about? Thank you. Who is next? I am next. Uh, Eduardo Suarez, Echo for Sustainable Development. You have mentioned about the issue of um, uh, that in the Middle East uh, and North Africa, people were uh, fighting for their own indigenous form of democracy, if there's going to be one. So um, I, as an organizer, have faced, not only in this region, and also in New York, where uh, uh, an old-time friend of mine, Ashikur, uh, is here, and we used to be in the, uh, the streets of Harlem. Um, the question is, <clears throat> one of the biggest problems that we have is having some of our brothers and sisters dictating from Washington what we should be doing at the local level. And I'm a proponent that we should be organizing at the lo uh, local level in, in a form of an indigenous um, uh, community-driven process to be able to achieve what we need in, in our own region and then connect with the other regions and so forth. What do you think about that strategy? You were next, and then Shakur, and there was one other hand over here? Okay. okay. Yeah, I, Lara Shepard Blue, I'm here today with the Springfield No One Leaves campaign. And the question I have, um, you know, you talked about the, the right wing populist Tea Party backlash against um, public sector workers, and some of them, have, some of us have seen them, you know, holding their signs about how public sector workers are leeching from the taxpayers and all that. And they have all the, you know, like they're this clique that has all these rights that the rest of us will never have. And I'm wondering, how do we get the message out there that we need the right to organ? EFCA is not dead. We need to revive it and make it, you know, bigger and broader. Um, so that people see that it's not just that this, you know, this small group of workers has things that the rest of us don't have, but that we all need the access to, de you know, to decent jobs, to jobs with dignity, to affirmative action, to benefits, pension plans. You know, these aren't things that that should be, you know, held by a small group, but extended to all. So if we can, if we can find a way to get that message to folks that what we need is the real right to organize in this country, the real right to strike, because if you can be fired. For organizing, you can be fired for striking. I'm sorry, it's not the right to, to organize and to strike. So how do we how do we get that out there? Tim Parker with Progressive Democrats of America. Thanks, Bill, for being here. At the end of your speech, you touched on what I think is a really important discussion for those of us that are allies of Jobs with Justice. If you could spend a little more time, it was a rich conversation last night that we had, and that is being part of a larger social movement to move an electoral strategy. Who are our friends and allies that we know? within the Democratic Party. We know that the Democratic Party is not a monolith. We know that PDA is an insurgency inside the Democratic Party. Can you articulate who our friends and allies are in this struggle as we take forward the inside-outside piece as we move out today? Thank you. We're going to let Jack Cora have the last and then give the floor to Bill and we'll run a little bit over and then we'll have lunch and continue the conversation over lunch. Great speech, Bill. Uh, you. uh, your, your point on uh, Creating a little mischief and uh, issues of, uh, of strategic alliance and not just tactical alliance. I, I was a uh, part of the um, group of black leaders from around Massachusetts that um, protested in front of the state house. And now we're we're putting forth a resolution that kind of talks about collective bargaining as a, as a democratic right. Thank you. What about that as an idea? We we was thinking about it as remembering how. Um, Resolutions that all over the country um, 
helped the, the movement around South Africa. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that, that was a way, whether it was in New York City, where we knew we could get it easy, or, or somewhere like uh, uh, um, in Mississippi, that it was a way to create a little mischief. And also we found out that sometimes uh, we could win where we thought we couldn't win. So uh, what about that as, a, as an idea for us to be able to begin to build some low hanging fruit to begin to build that strategic alliance? Okay, um, so here, there's a strategic problem right now. Uh, a speaker never wants to be between people and food. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I am going to, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot, but uh, this will be abbreviated. Um, uh, let's see. The, um, first I just want to say that Shakur is a very old friend of mine uh, for like more years than I can think of, so I, I just I appreciate him doing it. And I see Erica Smiley, who was uh, announced before we got started, and I also just want to recognize her, uh, who's also a very good friend of mine. Um, part of these come together. The, um, I'm not going to take these in order exactly. But let me just say something about this middle class. I don't use the term middle class. If I said middle anything, I say middle income, because I don't know what a middle class is. Um, but I do know roughly what middle income means. I mean, so I'm uh, talking about income issues. One of the things I think we have to talk about, when, when the labor movement talks about we need a uh, middle class, there's an implication that we're not talking about poor people anymore. Yeah. And, and this is actually very frightening. Um, and, and I think that we need to align with groups that are out of the professional managerial strata of society. Absolutely. But, you know, if old Randolph put it well that when he said, um, you know, the unions, the trade union movement has been a movement of the dispossessed, the downtrodden. And that's who we should always be talking about. And, and the, uh, it relates to uh, this issue, this larger issue of, of AFCA, we lost AFCA not because we were sold out by <clears throat> people um, like Blanche Lincoln. We lost AFCA because our leaders thought that this was going to be an inside the beltway operation and that it could be done on the basis of, you know, um, media ads, things like that, as opposed to mobilizing people. Yeah. The problem we have around collective bargaining, where collective bargaining exists, particularly for public, for public workers, I think that we can do a lot of what Shakur was raising uh, in terms of moving resolutions. I think that we, people don't want things taken from them. And I think that that's one powerful stream that we're feeling out there, that this sense of, a kind of authoritarian power grab. But winning people to the right to collective bargaining, I think, happens in the context of talking about economic justice. It's not, I don't think that we win it simply on the basis of talking about this is a right or the ILO says we should have it or whatever. Um, and, and that was one of the uh, areas of disagreement I had with the AFL-CIO around Africa. In addition to, I think that they made a very big mistake by essentially leaving the door open so that the right could pose as the defenders of workers' democracy. Mm -hmm. um, this was a big problem. See, the problem is not car check versus elections. The problem is the employer. That's the problem. We've got to get the employer out of the entire process. The employer has no right to be there. That's the discussion we need to have. Because when you start messing around on the issue of elections, when I saw George McGovern do an ad against EFCA, I knew it was over. Right? It was over. Um, so I think that we've got to look at, we've got to be a movement that's talking about the disenfranchised. And the disenfranchised and dispossessed can be de described very broadly. We're going through an economic crisis right now where there's entire sections of the population that are unemployed that never knew unemployment. They never conceived that they would be unemployed. 
We need to be reaching out to them. Yeah. And one of the things that I've been pushing for a long time is that we need to have a movement of the unemployed. That means resources have to be devoted to it. I've been trying to talk to funders to get money for a movement around the unemployed. And these funders, they, they, they're basically waiting for the economy to improve before we start organizing the unemployed. And I'm not exaggerating, right? They, seriously, that's what they're saying to me, right? Um, no, this isn't really the right time. Well, damn it, when is the right time? When the unemployment is like 2%? You know what I mean? When, when should we be organizing the unemployed? So we need something like that right now. So winning the right of collective bargaining is related to building a movement for economic justice, which I think is part of, it's central to the mission of Jobs with Justice. A movement for economic justice is not just a movement for collective bargaining. It's a movement to defend the unemployed. It's a movement for worker cooperatives in places in dead cities where there is not going to be capital investment. It ain't going to happen again. Right? You know, we can, we can redesign our central areas as much as we want, but at the, at the end of the day, there's entire cities that are effectively dead, and they're only going to be relocation centers for immigrants. Right? We've got to have economic, that's economic justice. We've got to be talking about this. Economic justice is also about these trade agreements that Republicans and Democrats keep pushing down our throats. We've got to talk about not just the economic injustice that we face here, but the economic injustice that the Mexicans feel as a result of NAFTA, and the Colombians will feel, as others will feel. Right? We've got to talk about economic, um, economic justice. And so it relates to this thing that Tim was raising. Who are some of our friends? Well, I don't want to name a whole lot of names, but I think about people like Barbara Lee and Graham. Right? You know, they, they, they are, there's a whole set of people that have had the courage to identify with PDA that I think of as our friends. We need many more. We need people, Shakur, in, you know, uh, that you're talking about that are going to run for office on an economic justice platform. We need folks up in New Hampshire that will run against that kind of law that was described. Okay? That's what we need as a movement for economic justice. Um, and so to the final thing, well, to, well, I guess it relates to this issue about how do we stop supporting, um, I, I was going to use a certain word, but I'll use another one, supporting you know, sort of bankrupt politicians. Well, how do you stop when you sort of just stop? Um, that, that you, but, but the way you do it, I think, in the unions is that we have to have debate in our organizations about endorsements. You know, we don't do that. I mean, let's be, let's be real. The executive board or maybe the, 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 the president, you know, basically makes the call. We need to have debate. And one of the things with debate, debate's a risky, because you may go the wrong way, right? Yeah. The members may vote a completely different way, but damn it, let's have that discussion. Let's have real education where we're talking with our members about what's really at stake, so that when we do endorse, People understand that they were part of the decision. They can't lay the distance themselves and say, I didn't make that decision, Bill made that decision, right? But no, we made that decision. That's part of what we have to do, and we have to hold these folks accountable, which sometimes means going after them. As I was saying last night, we should have a target list. We should be thinking about some of these conservative Democrats that have turned on us and we need to move against them, in addition to moving against them. Okay, so, so you can get to your food. Uh, the last point is uh, about uh, what was raised about uh, local organizing. One of the things um, that Fernando Gapacin and I proposed in our book, which is a shameless, shameless publicity stunt on my part right now, uh, to encourage you to buy the book. But in any case, we proposed this thing we call Working People's Assembly. And, and one of and, and a, and a working people's agenda, and part of what we're trying to get at is that we need to organize differently in the fight back. These strategic alliances that I talked about of coming together, working people's organizations coming together and establishing an agenda of action. This needs to be done at the local level, and it needs to be controlled by local forces. Now that will mean, let's be real, some of the international unions will get upset because some of these assemblies 
will come up with ideas that the internationals don't like. That's a tension we'll have to deal with, as the bumper sticker says, shit happens. At least I think that's what the bumper sticker says. Right? So we've got to move that fight. But we've got to organize locally, and we've got to use the local building of these blocks as, a, as an example of what needs to happen nationally. And um, I think I'm going to stop there because I don't want people to be on that side. Thank you very much. Thank you.